Welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast, a show where we take a closer look at the latest nutrition news, research, and trends so that you can make more informed choices and feel more confident about what you eat. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and as you are listening to this episode, I will be in Minneapolis, Minnesota for the annual Food and Nutrition Conference. This is the largest gathering of nutrition professionals in North America. It happens every year. And we'll just have to hope that no nutrition emergencies break out while we are all out of town. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about acrylamide. About 15 years ago, nutrition scientists announced some new guidelines for how much acrylamide you can safely consume. Now, at the time, most people had never even heard of acrylamide much less realized that they were supposed to be worried about it. So back in 2010, I did an episode on the subject just to help people put those concerns into perspective. Well, just last week, I happened to get emails from two different listeners, both asking about acrylamide. So I thought it was time to revisit the topic on the podcast and just bring you up to date with what's gone on since my original episode. Acrylamide is an industrial chemical that's used in wastewater treatment, paper and fabric manufacture, and chemistry labs. And anyone who uses acrylamide industrially knows that it needs to be handled with great care. If this stuff is ingested or inhaled in sufficient quantities, it can cause nerve damage. It's also been shown to cause cancer in animals. So you can imagine everyone's concern when it was discovered that many common food products, including cereal, coffee, french fries, and baked goods, contain small amounts of acrylamide. Now, you're not going to see this listed on the ingredient list because acrylamide isn't being added to these foods as an ingredient, but it turns out that small amounts of acrylamide form naturally when certain kinds of foods are roasted toasted, baked, or fried. Specifically, acrylamide is formed through a chemical reaction between sugar and the amino acid arginine. So starchy foods like potatoes and grains have the greatest potential for acrylamide production. And what that means is that humans have been consuming acrylamide for millennia, ever since they learned to roast potatoes over a fire. When it comes to more modern cooking methods, Boiling, steaming, and microwaving won't cause acrylamide formation, but baking, roasting, grilling, and frying can. And the higher the temperature and the longer the cooking times, the more acrylamide is likely to be formed. Now, you know what? I have to tell you that this was bad news for me personally. I don't actually eat a lot of french fries or potato chips, But I love roasted vegetables, especially when they're deeply caramelized. I like my toast kind of on the darker side, too. And come this December, when it's time for my annual sugar cookie, I'm going to be scanning that plate, looking for the one that got left in the oven just a little too long. And that extra brown sugar cookie is going to be higher in acrylamide than its paler neighbor. But the biggest primary sources of acrylamide in the typical modern diet is not burned toast or roasted vegetables. The primary sources are ready-to-eat cereal, french fries, potato chips, and coffee. Yes, coffee! But don't panic. Although roasted coffee beans contain relatively high levels of acrylamide, much of that is lost during the brewing process. And here are a few more details on that. Instant coffee generally contains more acrylamide than freshly brewed coffee. Light roasts may contain slightly more acrylamide than dark roasts because acrylamide levels peak during the early stages of roasting and then they decrease the longer you roast the beans. Espresso tends to have higher concentrations of acrylamide than filtered coffee due to the smaller volume of water that's used to extract the brew but you generally drink espresso in much smaller quantities. So that probably balances out. And finally, decaffeination does not significantly affect acrylamide levels one way or the other. So how big a danger does acrylamide really pose? Well, it all depends on how much of it you're taking in. Here in the United States, average intakes, even with all the French fries and potato chips that we tend to eat, are between 22 and 45 micrograms per day for adults. And that, according to toxicologists, is well below 
the threshold of safety. But typical intakes across different regions of the world vary hugely. In New Zealand and in the United Arab Emirates, typical intakes ranged from 75 to 150 micrograms a day for an average-sized adult. Spain and China, on the other hand, had the lowest average intakes, about 15 to 20 micrograms per day for an adult. When you adjust for their smaller body size, intake among children ends up being two to three times higher. And finally, it obviously depends on your diet. If you don't eat a lot of french fries and potato chips, you're probably getting less than that average figure. Since the potential dangers or concerns about excessive acrylamide exposure from food have become more widely recognized, the European Commission has established acceptable levels for acrylamide in various food categories. In the United States, our FDA has not yet set regulatory limits, but in 2013, they released an action plan to reduce acrylamide in food and focusing on education and voluntary industry efforts. So in response to these initiatives, many food manufacturers have made significant progress in reducing acrylamide levels, particularly in potato chips and crackers. And they've achieved this by selecting potato varieties that have a lower sugar content, so there's less sugar to interact. They've adjusted processing temperatures and times. There's even an enzyme that can be used to break down the precursors to acrylamide. So some companies, as a result of all of these efforts, have been able to report reductions of up to 90% in certain products. So I'm not saying that acrylamide is nothing to worry about, but I do think we need to put this threat in perspective. So here's my personal assessment of the risk. If you are eating a reasonably healthy, balanced diet, including lots of fresh vegetables, even if they're roasted, and other whole foods, I suspect that acrylamide probably poses a pretty minimal risk to your well-being. If, on the other hand, you live on french fries, potato chips, and crackers, your acrylamide intake might be closer to that zone of concern, but you know what? (laughs) That may actually be the least of your worries if that is your steady diet. So, personally, I'm not going to stop roasting my vegetables. I'm not going to stop drinking coffee because I think the benefits of those foods clearly outweigh the small risks. I will continue to limit my intake of French fries, potato chips, and yes, sugar cookies. And not primarily because of their acrylamide content, but limiting my intake of these types of foods also does help keep my acrylamide level low. And hopefully it will make up for that extra dark sugar cookie. Now, I also want to acknowledge here that we do not all have the same threshold or tolerance for risk. To some people, even a very low risk of harm is unacceptable. So if you are concerned about acrylamide, I suggest on focusing on the changes that are going to have the biggest impact on your intake. And by far, the biggest things you can do to reduce your exposure are, number one, don't eat a lot of French fries or potato chips. And I think this is good advice no matter which way you cut it. Number two, avoid burned or darkly browned toast or baked goods. Toasting bread to a light golden color rather than dark brown to will significantly reduce the acrylamide levels. Now, obviously, the more often you eat toast or baked goods, well, then the more that that's going to matter. Number three, moms, you might want to skip the teething biscuits. The amount of acrylamide in commercial teething biscuits is moderate, but when you consider how small babies are and the fact that children tend to be more vulnerable to these sorts of toxins, I think it makes more sense to avoid them. Try a piece of frozen bagel, untoasted, instead. Number four, if you are roasting, frying, or air frying your potatoes, Soak the potatoes after they've been cut in some water before you cook them. That will help reduce acrylamide formation when they cook. And finally, don't smoke or breathe secondhand smoke. Cigarette smoke is the primary non-food source of acrylamide exposure. If you have a question you'd like me to answer, you can email it to me at nutrition at quickanddirtytips.com. You can also leave me a voicemail at 443-961-6206. I always love to hear your voice 
And I'll close by reminding you that Nutrition Diva is a quick and dirty tips podcast where our team includes Brandon Getches, Nathan Sems, Davina Tomlin, Holly Hutchings, and Morgan Christensen. That is it for me. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week.